right. You're alive, Mr. Dobbs. All right, board members, if we would, uh, I would like to call the Griffin Spalding County Board of Education virtual call meeting to order. Uh, and if you would, make sure that you keep yourselves on mute uh, unless you are about to talk or needing to talk. That way, there's if there's any background noise or uh, things that will that will help with that that process and things will go well. Um, and I did not ask Miss Sue if she had a flag. Um, she does. Wonderful. Well, I will open with prayer and then Sue, if you will uh, unmute and lead us in that pledge that would be great let us pray father lord i just thank you for this day lord we thank you father lord for griffin spalding county we pray for your wisdom and direction in this meeting lord we are so passionate and concerned about our teachers about our students about our parents Lord, we want to make the very best decisions for them Lord, we ask father lord of all of the families that are continued to be affected by covid19 we ask you to touch them and to heal them and we pray, Father Lord, that we'll be able to have a speedy recovery as a as a community, as a state, and as a nation in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Good morning. Well, how many can we a number that was of how many cases? Mr. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Yeah, you're gonna have to. Yeah, we try. Okay, I think that Miss Sue has been frozen. I'm not sure if she has gotten kicked off yet or not. So we will. Move on from that. Can everybody hear me? All right. So board members, uh, we will then move into the adoption of our agenda. I would entertain a motion for that. So move. I have a motion. I am waiting on a second. I think that Miss Sue has been knocked off. Are you interested in seconding that, Mr. Brown? I am not. Well, we will wait for Miss Sue to come back on. What's funny, Mr. Shepard? Okay. So, Mr. Chair, that's how we're going to handle that. We're going to let just people just laugh and and be out of come out of character. Okay. It looks like Mr. Smith has just gone back on. Um, We're not going to address the board attorney just hysterically laughing and. Um, Mr. Brown, I'm not sure what, what he was laughing at because he's on mute and there may be something else going on in his room. Um, I don't know what that situation he should is. Be a, he should be a professional and be focused on the board meeting and not laughing because everybody can see him on camera. Definitely got to grow up. Mr. Brown, I, I don't know if you know you were still on, not unmuted. Oh, I. Does anyone know if Miss Sue is trying to join back in? Can they go?
I don't see her trying to join in, Mr. Mr. Doss. Okay, I'm gonna text her real quick to make sure she knows she is not in. Did you get my text from Mr. Holmes? I did not. Mr. Smith, get kicked out of the room. No, he's here. Okay, I did get your text now. Uh, does not look like Mr. Holmes is going to be able to to make it. Okay, I've just sent a text to Miss McDonald to see if I'm back on Mr. Goss. Okay, wonderful. I had to reboot. Uh, not a problem. We uh, oh, yeah. had, a motion, yeah. had a motion for the adoption of our agenda and we're looking for a second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none. When, when, we, when we get into the, as it relates to our concerns and being able to voice our concerns from our constituents that have reached out to us, uh, will we be able to have a moment to do that outside of the questions that may be allotted at the end of the presentation, Mr. Doss, as it relates to uh, the presentation that Dr. Kennedy is going to do? If I understood you correctly, after the presentation, if you have any care or concerns or want to share anything, will you be able to ask those questions pertaining to the reopening of school? Absolutely. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. So we all in favor signify by raising your hand. We can see you. I have two in favor. Those opposed. Actually, Ms. Cook, did you? I wasn't able to see your hand. So if your hand was up, I voted, on the I voted for. Can you see me? I I can see your eyes. Okay. Okay. All so right. we, we have three, and those that are opposed. Okay, we have one. So we will move forward then. Uh, Miss Joni, any additional public comment or any pu public comments come in? No, there have been no public comments. Okay, we will move then on to Dr. Kennedy for our presentation about reopening of our schools. Thank you. Uh, Lonnie or Joni, are you able to pull up the presentation? Yes, I'll pull up. Board members, don't forget to mute for background noise purposes. Good morning, Mr. Smith and members of the board. Uh, today we're bringing from the GSES Start of School Task Force um, an update involving a recommendation for reopening of schools uh, for the 2020-21 school year. And we'll wait a moment so that they can pull up the PowerPoint. It's on the agenda. It's the reopening. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next slide. Uh, before we get in, into some of the information, I do want to review uh, a few slides in here that uh, would be uh, a reminder of some things that we discussed on June 16th. One of those is just uh, the information in reference to the charge of the task force or where the task force did go through and review all of the guidance provided by the Center of Disease for Disease Control, the Georgia Department of Public Health, Governor's Executive Orders, and the Georgia Department of Education regarding reopening schools. Uh, we also had to identify and examine possible options for a safe reopening and look at all of the aspects for the school district's operations. Next slide. Uh, for today's uh, presentation, you did receive some uh, other documents, so I just wanted to kind of list those out 
in reference to uh, what information uh, has been shared, uh, which will be the board presentation for reopening schools recommendation. You received the parent survey results, the staff survey results, results, and also the GSCS reopening of schools plan um, document as well. Next slide. Just wanted to remind individuals uh, in reference to the various documents and guidance and resources uh, that we've uh, been monitoring and looking at throughout this process. Uh, that includes the CDC considerations for schools document, uh, the multiple governor's executive orders that have been uh, posted and presented, the Georgia Department of Education and Georgia Department of Public Health guidance document that's titled Georgia's Path to Recovery for K-12 Schools. Uh, we've also engaged with our local uh, district public health department and emergency management systems, as well as looked at other documents around um, the framework of, of safely reopening our schools. Next slide. A part of this information included um, the Georgia Department of Public Health that has identified the transmission category levels of county using a 14 day transmission period of COVID-19 data to determine transmission category levels for counties across the state of Georgia. As cases continue to be investigated and data checks are performed, the status of a county uh, can change. Currently, uh, Spalding County's transmission uh, levels is uh, categorized as minimum to moderate spread. Again, um, as continue, um, data continues to come in, um, the category level and determination of a county can change. But based on where we are today with the minimum moderate spread, next slide, we have been closely looking at the Georgia's path to recover for K-12 schools. So this is a graphic that was also shown on June 16th. Um, and you can see in the center of that graphic, you have the minimum to moderate spread and the options that we have before us in reference to reopening schools that includes uh, traditional hybrid or full distance remote learning. And so we have been looking at this and uh, paying a closely attention to this information as we uh, looked at the plan for moving forward. And these, uh, this was some of the information we used in determining um, the three options that was presented on June 16th. Next slide. Uh, just to review those three options again, uh, we have option one, which provides a normal resumption of in-school operations while implementing a remote at home option for parents to sign up or if they're not comfortable sending their uh, child back to school for the first nine weeks. Uh, in this option, uh, the parent would need to commit uh, to the nine week period if, the, if this option is selected. Uh, this would allow the school district to plan and effectively staff for option one. Option two was the remote full day in school or full day and full day independent remote learning. This was a blended learning uh, alternating days uh, model using an A or B schedule for students as allows where A students attend school on Monday and Wednesday with remote learning days on Tuesday and Thursday. B schedule remote learning on Monday and Wednesday and attend on Tuesday and Thursday. And then we had option three, which was remote, which was a rotational schedule for a full week in school and then a full week independent remote learning. Uh, this was based on a two week cycle model. Students were going to be divided up into two groups, group A and group B. Uh, group A students will come for one week, Monday through Thursday, and then go out for a week for remote learning while group B comes in on campus. Um, we, will, we were going to, we will use Fridays for uh, teacher planning. Next slide. As a part of the process, we did uh, survey all of our parents and guardians and asked them to complete uh, a survey to gather their feedback on the three options as well as other information related to the reopening of schools. We received 3,008 English responses and 78 uh, Spanish responses from parents and guardians. 
giving us a total of 3,080 cents. Parents and guardian responses to the survey resulted in a 57% participation rate based on the number of households we are anticipating to serving for the 2020-21 school year, which is 5,367. Uh, the survey was launched on June 12th and closed on June 22nd. Uh, this chart here shows the number of responses identified based on each school that the student may be attending for the upcoming school year. So this is just giving you just a breakdown as to uh, where students um, based, where students, what school students attended based on the parents and guardians who uh, participated in the survey. Next slide. Then uh, we had, of course, the questions um, that we want to take a moment to review. Uh, the first swear identifies the role in reference to being a parent or guardian. Um, and then it moves into the second square uh, box there that was the opening question in reference to uh, feeling comfortable coming back into just the uh, brick and mortar setting. We had 70.6% of parents and guardians believe that it was reasonable or very reasonable for all student and faculty populations to be welcomed back to the brick and mortar campus. We also had 80.9% of parents and guardians believe that it is reasonable or very reasonable to implement option one, which was the normal resumption of in-school operations while implementing a remote learning option for the first nine weeks. Of the parents and guardians who were interested in the remote at home learning part of option one, we had 83.4% of those parents indicated that they had reliable internet access. Next slide. On um, here, these results presented uh, where we had 58.4% of those interested in remote at home learning um, indicated that they will, would need a device uh, for the at home remote learning. We had 54.6% of parents and guardians believe that it is reasonable or very reasonable to implement option two, which was the AB alternating days rotational schedule. We had 46.5% of parents and guardians believe that it is reasonable or very reasonable to implement option three, which was the uh, two week cycle uh, model of rotating a full weekend and a full week for independent remote learning. And we have 48.6% of parents and guardians indicate that their child will ride the school bus uh, next year under normal transportation operations. Next slide. And the uh, last question for parents was, uh, we had 80.4% of parents and guardians believe that it is reasonable or very reasonable to restrict visitors and volunteers from entering the building at the start of the school year. Next slide. This brings us to our staff uh, survey results. We did also uh, have a survey to survey all of our staff members across the school district to gather their feedback and input on the options, uh, as well as additional information for the reopening of schools. We have approximately 1,500 employees and uh, we had 1,081 of those 1,500 employees respond to the survey resulting in a 72% participation rate. Again, this survey was launched on June 12th and closed on June 22nd. And here you will see the results show that 54.9% of the staff members who responded were teachers, 11.2% were certified support staff, 27.3% were classified support staff, and 6.6% were administrators. We also had 65.6% .6 of the staff members believe that it was reasonable or very reasonable for all student and faculty populations to become, to be welcomed back to the brick and mortar campus. We had 68.8% .8 of staff members believe that it was reasonable or very reasonable to implement option one. 
We had 59.2% of staff members believe that it was reasonable or very reasonable to implement option two. Next slide. And we had 46.1% of staff members believe that it was reasonable or very reasonable to implement option three. We also had 19% of staff members indicate that their child will ride the uh, school bus next year under the normal transportation operations. I do want to note here that the question did not apply to 67.6% uh, .6 of the staff members who responded. Well, it had 91.4% of staff members believe that it was reasonable or very reasonable to restrict visitors and volunteers from entering the building at the start of the school year. We also did ask staff members some additional organizational questions to help us plan for the school year. And these are the re following results for those questions. 63.5% of staff members believe that it is reasonable or very reasonable to have students pick up their meals from the cafeteria and return to the classroom to eat. Next slide. Ninety two point five percent of staff members believe that it was reasonable or very reasonable to establish and coordinate hand washing routines for students within their classroom schedule. Seventy eight point seven percent of staff members believe that it is reasonable or very reasonable to eliminate group bins of student supplies. Sixty six point eight percent of staff members believe that it is reasonable or very reasonable to define seating arrangements within the classroom and other areas. The last question of the staff survey was to provide the Human Resources Department with information related to staffing for the upcoming school year. With this question, we had 66.3% of staff members indicate that they will be able to come to work, while 33.7% of the 1,081 staff members responded that they may be unable to come to work because of one or more of the following reasons if schools or daycare centers remain closed, if other services are unavailable and they may have to care for or for a dependent, or if the staff member or member of their household fell into one of the categories identified by the CDC as being at high risk for serious complications from the pandemic virus. The Human Resources Division is reaching out to uh, these individuals and following up with uh, any concerns that they may have regard resulting from um, that particular question. Next slide. Here you have all of the, the overall survey uh, results by option. Uh, this includes where is combined all of the parent results with the staff results. Uh, you can see the legend where we did color code here. Uh, the green is representing anyone who responded very reasonable or reasonable. The yellow is less than reasonable and the red is not uh, not reasonable or very inappropriate. So if you look at the three options here, option one had 78% reasonable and very reasonable. Option two, 56% reasonable or very reasonable. And option three, 47% percent reasonable or very reasonable. Next slide. Uh, these are potential numbers of students by school of parents or, or guard, guardians who indicated that they would be interested in the remote learning choice provided as part of option one. A total of 2,975 students were indicated this response will be confirmed by each school uh, if this uh, option, if option one is uh, selected. If option one is selected, we will have a form uh, that we, has been created for remote learning so that parents will be able to sign up and commit to uh, remote learning for the first nine weeks. And so um, that would be the way that we will confirm if that is truly what their decision would be for the 2020-2021 school year if we did move forward with option one. 
If this number holds true, it could potentially reduce our on-campus student numbers by 29% for the first nine weeks of school. Next slide. So now we've come to uh, the recommendation after much consideration, discussion, discussion and reviewing of all of the information, guidance and survey results. The following recommend, recommendation is being made. Option one is recommended for consideration and implementation for the upcoming school year with a one week delay start date for students as, uh, as of August 12th. All staff members will report as normally scheduled. The one week delay start for students will allow for additional staff training, full implementation of logistical processes, and time to receive any additional information, supplies, and materials needed for effective implementation. Parents who would select the remote learning choice part of this option would be committing for the nine week period to allow for effective planning and staffing. Um, for this particular recommendation, we did develop the GSES reopening plan, um, has been developed to support option one. Next slide. And if you would go ahead and click on the link for us. Of course, I will not be reading through this entire documents, but there are some uh, parts that I do want to highlight. Uh, it, you will notice, as you've re uh, I'm sure already reviewed the document, that pages six, two through six gives a listing of task force members and subcommittee members. Again, I do want to extend a bit thank you to these individuals for all of their diligent and hard work and in, in helping to uh, support the efforts in developing and thinking through all of these particular items. When you come to page seven, here you would find all of the background information and also the listing of, three, of the three options that were considered uh, in this process. As you move on to page eight through 11, you will find the survey data results that we've just uh, gone through as part of the presentation. And where we will stop is page 12. Here at page 12, uh, in, from page 12 through the remainder of this document, uh, provides the specific information related to the plans of implementation for option one. We will look at a, a few things that are under each of these points. Uh, if you recall back on June 16th in the previous presentation, I mentioned about the five component areas uh, that we aligned all of the work to uh, in reference to the operations of the schools. And so you will see this first component area, which is maintaining uh, healthy operations. Under this area, you will see that it has uh, the staffing. Uh, under staffing, I do just want to uh, mention that one of the things that the task force uh, committee uh, really looked at was uh, knowing how difficult it is um, to have a teacher to be engaged in remote learning and if it's on campus teaching. And so our human resources division is already uh, working on a plan that would identify remote learning teachers and on campus teachers. So there is a process that is being worked on for that. If we move down to page 13, I do want to just highlight uh, under staffing evaluation, some information that we are already aware of on page 13 right here. Uh, you would note that in this section, it does indicate that we've are, and it has already been announced by the Georgia Department of Ed and Governor Kemp um, that the Georgia Department of Education is suspending the teacher evaluation summative rating for the 2020-21 school year. And so we are already aware of that. Uh, 
and you will note that it says, you know, the information there where principals will continue to support employees with training and regular feedback on job performance so they can most effectively serve students in this new and unusual environment. However, there will be no high states testing or summative performance ratings issued for the 2020-21 school year. So we are aware of that. And so I just wanted to bring your attention to that uh, note there. If we move down under the next part, data and assessments, I do just want to, on page 14, under milestones, want to note here that the Georgia Department of Education has applied for a waiver regarding the state assessment for the 2020-21 school year and they are awaiting a decision from the Federal Department of Education, but they have applied for a waiver in reference to the milestones testing. So I do did want to note that as well. If we move down to page uh, under component uh, two, which is instruction and supports component, uh, this starts on page 14 and it goes through a good bit of the document through page 23. In this section, it does lay out a lot of the academic programs, including regular ed, special ed, our ESOL population, gifted education, pre-K uh, program, dual enrollment. You also note CTAE, the multi-tier support system that includes our PBIS programs, social emotional learning, and mental health. We also have technology laid out in this portion, as well as extracurricular activities, including athletics and our after school program. And so there's a lot of information and details uh, regarding uh, how those programs will look under option one. When you get to page uh, 23, we have the component of promoting behavior. This is the third component of the program, and that starts on page 23. And this is promoting behavior to reduce the spread. Uh, the CDC considerations for schools, as well as the Georgia Path to Recovery for K-12 schools, uh, highly recommend um, providing training and education to staff and students around how to stay safe. And so we have developed this component of some, uh, some staff training uh, that will occur prior to the start of school, as well as some um, educational uh, pieces and uh, training that we would work with students on. Uh, we will look to send this information out to parents um, to start uh, sharing with students, and then these will be used as continued reminders in education on a daily basis while students are in school. Then you have the fourth component, which is maintain the healthy environment. And that starts uh, here on page uh, 23, I believe we are on page 23 still. Excuse me, page 24. I do want to read through a couple of items here because th these are uh, include a lot of the uh, safety protocols and items that we will be looking to put in place. Uh, one of the very things we definitely want to strongly encourage is students and staff, if they are sick, we want them to stay home. We want them to stay home if they are sick. Uh, we will be sanitizing our buses and our classrooms. Uh, we will provide sanitizer stations at two entry points at each school location. Uh, we are looking to uh, close out the water fountains and provide uh, cups for drinking water and also encourage parents to re send reusable water bottles uh, for school for students to school. Uh, we are supplying gallon jugs of water and cups to classrooms that do not have sinks. Uh, eliminating field trips for first semester. Uh, that was one of the recommendations strongly that came out in a lot of the guidance that we were looking through. Uh, providing needed uh, protective, personal protective equipment to appropriate personnel, examine opportunities for outside activities for specials when possible, uh, use remote learning uh, parent choice um, student numbers, as we talked about those numbers that 2,900 students that, uh, that could be potentially remote learning students, 
looking at how those numbers are going to impact the classroom by uh, if we have those students doing remote learning, then uh, the schools, their uh, staff members and administrators are able to balance out classrooms to allow for spacing of students in the classrooms, additional spacing and to promote that social distancing, uh, which you also see there eliminating group assemblies that do not allow for six feet social distancing. Uh, we'll be looking at rearranging desks and furniture in classrooms to allow for as much space between uh, students, teachers as possible. And we will be uh, asking that all of the um, furniture arrangements have students' desks facing in the same direction. Um, again, these were a lot of the recommendations that were uh, coming forth as we were reviewing all of the guidance. Have all students and staff wear face masks and um, face, face mask, face coverings or masks in common areas and in areas where six feet social distancing cannot be maintained. And this will include classrooms. Uh, students and staff members may bring their own face coverings, uh, or we will have uh, face coverings to provide for them. Uh, reducing student travel to different areas of the building when that is possible we're looking at schedules and how that can be how that can happen uh, implementing um, to classes and step a movement student where possible share supplies and materials uh, we will be looking at ways in reference to the media center, uh, how we would uh, look as far as students checking out books, bringing books back, how those things will, uh, how we'll make sure that things are kind of sanitized and in between or, or quarantined in between checkouts uh, of materials and information. Uh, scheduled restroom breaks and hand washing routines throughout the day. Uh, avoiding handshaking hugs, uh, you know, teachers will have to come up and students will have to come up with creative ways and other hand signals. Uh, making sure that restroom and common areas are dis disinfected frequently. Uh, Anthony uh, Akins, our Executive Director of Administrative Services, along with Bruce Ballard, our Facilities Director, uh, will be looking at a formalized um, custodial cleaning process that will be implemented as we go into the school year. And we're also looking at minimizing visitors to the school facility. And that does the, and that's just not outside visitors. We're also in reference to even uh, district office visitors in our normal work, how we frequently go into the schools uh, throughout the year. We will be looking at ways to minimize uh, those visits as well as we go into the school year because we want to, again, uh, no plan will be foolproof, but we want to make sure that it is a, a, as safe environment as possible for our students and staff. If you will go on down to um, the next uh, item, facilities. I've already mentioned about turning off the water fountains. Uh, also making sure that uh, there's a good circulation of fresh air coming into the buildings. Uh, our maintenance and uh, facilities department are, are already looking at our ventilation systems and making sure that they are working uh, properly. Uh, we will be establish establishing isolation rooms for ill students or staffs or uh, if we have any visitors that end up uh, um, needing an isolation room. We're increasing our signage, and, and especially in our lower grades, and we're establishing uh, entrance and exit routes for uh, students um, to enter the different uh, school facilities. Uh, we are, as we've mentioned the signage here, uh, we are looking at various supplies and we have uh, accumulated and I uh, am planning uh, a lot of these supplies. And I do wanna give a big thank you to Mr. Akins who's been working on this for us uh, over the last several weeks to make sure that we will have any needed supplies on hand uh, to be able to uh, effectively move forward. And if we move now to sanitation, uh, we're looking at frequent sanitation of classrooms. Uh, we will be using, uh, incorporating a process that we did uh, during second semester 
uh, when in February, March, when this was the onset, we did provide every uh, classroom uh, disinfectant uh, in every area. And we asked teachers to spray down uh, their classrooms before they left uh, the, their class for the day. Uh, it's a very simple and easy process. They do not have to go back and wipe behind the disinfectant. They simply have to spray. It's a spray system where they just spray it and let it um, uh, work and they leave it. You leave it wet and let it dry on its own is how, that, uh, how it works. So there's no where they have to go back and wipe behind it or anything like that. So it's a very easy uh, system. We did implement that in February. We will plan on implementing that again. And, we have, our, and we've already implemented that with all of us returning to work for uh, when we did our return to work plan. So every person in the district uh, has the responsibility to spray down their work area with the disinfectant. We think that that's just a good practice for us to have in this uh, situation that we're in. All of custodial staffs will uh, be concentrating on high touch areas, restrooms multiple times throughout the day. Uh, they will continue with their cleaning of classrooms. Uh, and then we will have a protocol to isolate and deep clean and sanitize any impacted classroom spaces that may happen. And of course, reinforce good hygiene practices frequently um, throughout this process. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the supplies with uh, in reference to supplying signage. We will be supplying some consistent signage uh, across the district. And also if uh, schools want to uh, do some additional signs, we'll provide their those materials for them to be able to make any additional signs that they would like. On the nutrition, uh, we will be using to-go containers for all students uh, who are getting their meals. Uh, students may eat in the classroom settings as well as other identified areas to support social distancing and reduce the crowd size in any one location. Uh, we are going to be using markers or some type of tape uh, for the flooring to help distance students when they are in line or going through the cafeteria line waiting uh, to pick up their food as well. Um, and we're totally discouraging food sharing by students. We will not be allowing any type of food sharing uh, by students. You will see some other items there that students would need to come through the service line to pick up meals and check out at the cashier. Uh, we are encouraging parents and staff to use our pay payment, our My Payment Plus system uh, to pay for meals. And we will not use any a la carte sales for students and staff uh, as we start into the school year to help uh, minimize the uh, wait and the time spent at the terminal uh, where the cashier will be located. Under transportation, uh, we have the uh, that bus drivers and students will wear face masks and face coverings on buses. Uh, the buses will be cleaned and disinfected daily. And we are going to encourage um, parents, if they can transport their uh, child to school, we will encourage that. That will help us to minimize and reduce the number of students on the buses as well. If you can move down. Thank you. Under visitor procedures, uh, you will note there that uh, we do want to limit the visitors uh, to the buildings. Uh, parents will be asked to remain in cars during morning drop off. This will help us minimize the number of people going into the building. We really want the buildings to be where we have the uh, critical staff members that are needed to be there in order to provide instruction. Um, Temperature checks will happen with any, any volunteers, visitors, or uh, vendors. We are uh, asking that we do not have any classroom volunteers uh, as we go into the start of the school year, again, to help us minimize the number of individuals in a school. Uh, we are going to require face coverings and masks for any visitors that may come, and we're asking that those visitors be by appointment. 
Our maintenance uh, will be checking in at the front office uh, if they have to go out to a school and our nutrition vendors uh, will have to check in with nutrition managers uh, as they uh, on upon their arrival when they uh, get there. And then our fifth uh, component is preparing for when someone gets sick. And so here, of course, this is uh, where uh, our nurses and our Alicia Evans uh, will be working with schools to uh, locate an isolation area uh, that's outside of the clinic in each school for sick students, excuse me, or staff members. Uh, students uh, wait time, they will be definitely looking at that and uh, making sure that we are separating any sick students from students who are not sick if that's if that is uh, occurs. We also are going to establish procedures to ensure students and staff who become sick at school or arrive uh, to school sick are sent home as soon as possible. And you can see that listing of information there as well as if you can scroll down uh, as well as number six there, uh, we are developing a response protocol for positive COVID-19 exposures or tests that has been developed by our human resources division and our administrative services uh, division. Uh, so that we will have a protocol for if a student or a staff member becomes sick or, or tests positive for, COVID or, or exposed uh, to COVID-19, then we will have a process as to what that may look like and what impact that may have, uh, whether it may be um, where we may have to close a classroom or to quarantine a classroom um, for those uh, pieces, or if it uh, is large enough that we may have to look at uh, closing a school for a period of time of quarantine or if it gets to the point where we may have to look at uh, closing uh, the school district. And then you have the screening procedures that are outlined there in reference to, uh, we will be doing temperature checks on all students and staff as they enter. Actually, we are already doing that as we've returned to work, all staff members do. Uh, we do have a process for temperature checks where that is uh, looked at every day that a staff member enters the facilities here. So we will be utilizing that process as we move into the school year as well. And I do want to just note that, you know, this is the reopening plan that uh, if option one uh, is approved by the board, uh, we know that these plans could easily change depending on the uh, transmission category level, uh, depending on any uh, governor executive orders or any additional information or guidance that comes out even from the Georgia Department of Education and our local, local public health uh, department as well as Georgia Public Health. Uh, but this is the recommendation that we are putting forward uh, as of today for the restart of school for uh, Griffin Spalding County Schools for the 2020-21 school year. Thank you so much, Dr. Kennedy. A lot of work and effort going into that. Uh, board members, questions? Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to Dr. Kennedy and the team for the hard work that went into preparing this presentation of abstracting the data to be able to present to the board. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to just you know put this out there. I've had teachers, I've had scholars, I've had custodians reach out to me um, and asking you know all a lot of questions. And so um, I know that this is something that we we do want to put a lot of attention and detail to. Now, if you look through the chat that's going on right now through the live feed, um, I have some concerns as well. The concerns is that the numbers presented are not the current COVID cases, uh, which you went over, Dr. Kennedy. So the, the June 22nd is when the survey closed. It's now July 8th, and cases have increased in many different places. 
Also, we're not keeping in mind the number of teachers who do not live in Spalding County that are traveling from other counties where cases have increased as well. If you look at this, the confirmed cases in Spalding County, you're getting 15 cases a day. 15 cases a day. There are confirmed of 490 cases, hospitalizations, and this information was just from three o'clock yesterday. So as a school district, I have, and as a member of this board, I have, you know, concerns that I really um, need to get answers. A group of teachers sent me a letter, and I am going to read this letter so that they know that their voices are being heard. And I, I hope that the superintendent and whoever his designee are taking notes so that these questions can be answered as often sometimes my questions don't get answered. I'm still waiting back for answers. It reads, dear board members from educator representatives, as we are on the heels of a new school year, we are all facing with unprecedented uncertainty. As the nation's infrastructure has been affected by COVID-19 pandemic, the education of our children has not gone unscathed. Of all the subject matters on the agenda today, we can all agree that the blueprint of opening schools and what that will look like is the topic that will hold everyone's attention. Just the mere fact that the board meeting prior to reopening school for teachers in two weeks is a virtual meeting speaks on the sensitivity of the current health concerns. On June 12th, teachers and parents were encouraged to complete a survey to gather feedback and input to help drive decision making for reopening schools. Also occurring on the date we're close to 60,000 confirmed cases just here in Georgia. To date, there are over 97,000 confirmed cases. This is evident of the complexity, fluidity, sensitivity of the virus. With that being said, the board is presenting a plan based upon old data. Retrospectively, the plan seems to have been developed without consideration of some vital concerns. The concerns are included to the following. How will the immune compromised staff or students be affected? If people have conditions on the CDC list of a higher risk factors, are districts required to provide further accommodations? What options are there for people who care for someone who falls within the vulnerable population? What about staff members who are pregnant? Now they are at a greater risk. If staff have children in other districts that choose different models, how will that affect the teachers? If we aren't comfortable with the safety guidelines in place or not, what are the other options? Will staff be asked to sign a waiver to return to work? Will families need to sign a waiver? What about the sanitation of staff bathrooms as it relates to the frequency they are cleaned? What proof will any of us have that anyone returning to school is not currently living with someone who is positive of the virus? Many districts are already requiring 12 month employees to be in the building working without appropriate PPE. I know that in the presentation that it will go to PPE will go to the appropriate personnel. I'm not understanding what appropriate personnel is. I think every teacher that's going to be in a building needs PPE. How does this protect incoming staff? 11, has there been consideration that, that there's a service position that is of a higher risk socially and economically? As I look at the, do you have the confirmed cases for Spalding County? Okay, as I look at this, I'm looking at the zip codes and within those zip codes, we can say which are, which are in certain districts. So my concern becomes, how are we going to be able to manage this? And then if a teacher um, contracts COVID-19 and they have to quarantine, does that take care of their, their sick days? Their sick days are just washed away through that? So what is the district going to do to ensure that our teachers are going to be taken care of and that our scholars are going to be taken care of? In, in this, what is the timeline for notification of a plan? 
I know you said that, you know, it's being worked out through HR and through Anthony, Mr. Aiken, but why is this plan not already laid out so that teachers can adequately prepare for the implementation? And even in gathering this task force, you know, brought up during that meeting, is that had not one parent that did not have ties to GSCS outside of being an employee, and there were no students. And so their response was it was an oversight. But Stephen, with, within two weeks of that working, and I understand maybe most of the work had already been done, there was still not a parent invited to the table, nor a scholar invited to the table. OK, will teachers have time to prepare for classes instructionally and be able to properly sanitize between classes? How do you plan on doing the A days and B days? Um, what will happen in regards to substitutes? How will the teacher leave be accumulated using the event of the 14 day uh, quarantine requirement? Is Stephanie on the line to be able to answer that question? My understanding, Mr. Brown, is um, we are having to move forward with coming up with one of the options. I am in complete agreement with you that there are many things that are still left undone in order to make a, a final decision as far as when school opens and, and the safety and where we're there, because there's still a lot of work that has to be done. But I think that that work, de determining that option that we're going to go with uh, will allow them to continue that work. I know that Mr. But Mr. Smith, Chair, we need answers now. Parents need answers now. If you look into the, the, the group thread of the actual meeting right now, hopefully we have somebody, is a staff member monitoring those questions that are being asked right now? Mr. Smith? We're trying to um, get those, you've, you've thrown a lot of questions out. A lot of those were already discussed as part of this presentation. We may have to go back over those a little bit slower in order to uh, to reiterate what was already said, but many of those have already been addressed in the presentation. But we're gonna we're gonna Not need really, to decide. Sir. We're, I, I we're to. gonna, Mr. Brown, we're gonna need to decide what option before we can move forward with what and, that and, was going to look like. And, and before I can decide on this option, I want to make sure that the concerns that have come to me from people that live within my district teachers and parents, I want to make sure that they know that their concerns are being voiced. Whether it's already through the presentation, I want to make it known that I am voicing their concerns as their elected representative. This is what I'm here to do. I understand that completely. That's why I, I said it. I appreciate you sharing on this. This is not something that we can rush on. And I understand that we that we need to make a decision today and all that, but I do want to make sure that I have the uh, time to go through these concerns because that's what I was elected to do. Okay. So can and I continue? So, um, you have more concerns you're wanting to go through. I have more concerns that I have to go through um, from scholars' health concerns, um, school nurses. Also, moving on to staff with high risk family members, the mask requirements, multiple children across grade levels, and the current effective measures for remote learning and technology provisions. So like I said, this is why I asked in the beginning how long was the presentation? You know, we're always good for trying to cut people off and not let them finish their statements. And so that's why I'm here now to speak up for those people who elected me, number one, and to make sure that the district understands the questions that are being asked. Sure. Do you agree that uh, several of those questions are not going to be able to be answered until we know which of the options that we're going with? Well, I do. I, I can agree that whether they're not going to be answered, at least now is the time for staff to listen to those questions so that whatever option is voted on and passed, we can begin the work to start addressing those. Sure, absolutely. And Mr. I know, I'm sure that you have those to word that you can uh, email those so that we have those also. 
I Did will I hear? submit those, but also I will submit those, Mr. Chair. But again, as their elected representative, I want them to to know that their questions will be asked right now, right here, today. I, I hear you, and I think that you've done a great job at presenting those. I'm not done, sir. So uh, I know Ms. McDonald was trying to cut in, but I, I think I still have the floor. Okay, That's and fine. you have. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right, thank you so much. So um, I, I do want to know if Stephanie's on the line to answer that question. Uh, how will teacher leave be accumulated used in the event of a 14 day quarantine requirement? I am on the line, uh, Mr. Brown, and I have to be honest, the connection that I have, um, some of the words are cutting out. So I'm, I'm trying to hear the full questions and I, I thought you might have called on me a minute ago, but I wasn't sure. Um, there is a Family First Coronavirus Response Act, and there are different benefits that are set out through that act. And so there are um, different categories where um, employees can uh, um, qualify for leave under that act. For example, if um, a staff member um, does test positive for the virus. Um, there are 10 days of leave eligibility under that act. So it doesn't go against your sick leave balance. And so we've got all of that information posted on our website already. Under human resources, there is a specific page with um, lots of information and resources available to employees. Also that there are flyers that are posted in all schools um, that go over this, the um, leave options with that. And so we are working with employees as situations arise to make sure that they have these benefits available. And also um, if there is extended type of leave, the, there is a way to qualify for um, essentially family medical leave if there's an extended illness that would again qualify um, because specifically because of COVID. Thank you so much. Okay. And seeing that's how that's done. A person asks a question and the question is answered. Thank you so much, Ms. Dobbins, for that. The next question is, are teachers, and this is probably for Dr. Kennedy, I'm sure the other one can answer, but are teachers responsible for teaching in person and virtually? Dr. Kennedy. Uh, and now uh, what what I was saying during the presentation is that the human resources division is working on identifying remote learning, who will serve as remote learning teachers. There will be a process and who will be on campus teachers. So teachers will not be doing both. Good. OK, thank you. Um, and that I, I did hear that in the presentation, but I do want to just make sure that these questions are being answered by um, the professionals. Um, will substitutes be utilized in the event of a teacher having to quarantine, or will an entire classroom need to quarantine as a result? I didn't hear that full question. It was cutting in and out, Mr. Brown. I'm, I'm sorry. I couldn't yes, hear the full question. Will substitute be utilized in the event of a teacher having to quarantine or will an entire classroom need to quarantine as a result? That was one of the, and Stephanie may also uh, add in here, that is one of the response uh, to uh, any positive test or any exposure. We are developing that protocol that will outline what various situations and how that process will be handled if there's a positive test, uh, whether it's a student or a staff, it may end up that the whole class has to be quarantined. And that's a part of that process of protocols we're developing uh, at this mm -hmm. point. All right. Um, and I just uh, I just had a message from a parent um, and she said that it's OK for me to mention her child's name. Uh, Kate is a five year old and she is attending Future Road elementary school. Uh, Kate recently just found out that she gets anxiety by putting on a mask. So how will Kate be protected in her classroom environment? 
again, we will be looking at uh, appropriate hand washing routines. We will be looking at social distancing. We will be looking at sanitizing. And we are in, uh, we are looking at wearing masks. If there, we will be uh, addressing parents or if students have some medical concerns or conditions, those will be addressed on a case by case situation as we would in in our regular setting. With, even if COVID nineteen wasn't here, if there was some type of accommodation, um, so we will be looking at those in a case by case situation. Uh, but we will have all of those safety measures in place. Uh, to make things uh, to make it a safe environment as possible for all students and staff. I think also those okay. questions change based upon whether or not we go with option one or option two. So because option two, you okay. might have one particular answer, and option one, you would have a different different answer. But those are all okay. great. But regardless of option one or option two, the question is being asked. The question is out there, and that's why we're making record of it so that in the event that we go with option two, we can start preparing for those as well. So regardless of what option we go with, I believe that these are still valid concerns and questions. I appreciate uh, you know, that input. Balance goes back to my time. Um, as it relates to school nurses, what is the protocol for students with temperatures who are unable to be picked up? I guess I, I guess Dr. Kennedy, uh, since you led the task force, I guess you have to answer that question. Um, what is the protocol for scholars with temperatures who are unable to be picked up? You would know that in a part of that in the plan, a part of that protocol was looking at ways to transport a student back home. Um, and that was listed in the uh, in, as a part of the plan in the process that we will be looking at ways and whether that may be a bus that takes the student back home, but we will be looking at a way to transport that student back home from the school location. Okay. Right. So, and I just want to put it out there. I'm asking these questions for people who submitted these questions to me. So, I'm sorry. Re regardless, I said, I'm asking these questions for teachers, school nurses, scholars that, sent me these questions to ask as as their voice and so if it's in the presentation i'm glad that you're throwing up that that is back in the presentation but i just want to make sure that for those who are listening to let them know that their voice is being heard and their questions are being asked so i greatly appreciate y'all keep throwing that up that's that's really good thank you so mr. much brown, can i right. can i add something mr brown uh, uh sure uh i, I just want to also say in in there we uh, did note that we are identifying isolation rooms or isolation areas at each school so that uh, if a student can't be picked up immediately or in the interim while we're um, arranging transportation, there is a place for them to to wait so that they can be monitored by the nurse. All right. All right. And so for those parents that are on, uh, you just heard that answer from Mr. Aiken. So um, I'm glad that we were able to get that addressed. Next question becomes, um, so you just and you just answered the next question as it relates to a room that will be identified. So that takes care of where will students quarantine with, with any symptoms. And, um, and of course, we know that nurses are adequately prepared to deal with any cases that may arise throughout the school day. So. Um, that takes care of my nurses, school nurses checkbox there. So we can move on to the next set. Scholars with health concerns. Um, how are children with medical issues being considered throughout this COVID-19 reopening plan? Uh, again, we will work with individual parents and students that may have any medical concerns as they are sharing those then we will be working with them uh, independently in reference to what their concerns or conditions are. Okay. All righty, let's move on to our next category. Staff with high risk family factors. Um, I'll respond to that. This is Stephanie Dobbins. Um, any okay. other 
employees that indicated they had a concern about may maybe not being able to return to work. We have already contacted them directly um, and provided the paperwork to request an accommodation. So all employees have the opportunity to apply for that, whether it's based on their personal uh, illness or a family member that lives in their home being high risk or if there are child care issues. So those all have to be looked at on an individual basis um, based on the specifics of um, their personal situation. And um, so we are already working on that. And I know um, just from talking a lot with a lot of those people that um, indicated a concern, the majority of those concerns were child care issues. And um, so I think uh, the decision today, if people know um, that we're going with option one and students can uh, return to school, then a lot of employee concerns about childcare will be um, taken care of. Mm -hmm. Okay. So other question becomes um, for, is it what now? Okay, so um, another question because I just had a um, a scholar who just sent me a message on Facebook, um, Mr. Brown. So we know that in fine arts classes, such as chorus, breathing techniques, and expulsion of secretions is imminent. How will this be handled? One of the how will how will the fine arts class for breathing and expulsion of secretions is imminent be handled. One of the things um, that uh, the finance department is finance department is looking at is utilizing smart music, uh, which is a program uh, that we are looking into. Uh, Dr. Warren uh, has spoken with them about this program, and they will be utilizing that uh, to go through mm -hmm. some of those exercises that require. Um, those techniques. Okay. Thank you so much for that answering that question. I um, oh, and the scholar says thank you as they are listening right now. So we greatly appreciate that. So let's talk about mass requirements. Um, I guess our district is not going to be bold enough to say that we're going to require people to wear masks. I know other school districts have. Um, and like I said, I, I really feel for students like Kate, who um, has anxiety issues um, when they put on a mask. So um, I know that we're going to look at how we're going to, um, you know, keep our scholars safe and our teachers safe in that environment. Now, will we will we make sure that all teachers who are in the building, will they have PPE? Well, I did want to go back because a part of our recommendation is that all students and staff wear face covers and masks or mask. Um, so that is a part of the plan. And so that would be if the if a face covering and mask uh, cannot be uh, if the student or staff member is unable to bring their own, we will be providing that. We also will have gloves available uh, at the school location. Uh, we will have, um, and I'm not sure, Anthony, what the correct term is, but at the front office uh, area, we will have the uh, plexiglass set up for the uh, separation there for front office staff. Uh, we will have uh, face shields uh, that we will be utilizing for uh, different groups, uh, including our bus drivers. Um, so different groups and categories of um, depending on what the work is. So we will have face shields as well. Uh, so we are providing some protective uh, personal personal protective equipment uh, in regards to face shields. Uh, plexiglass uh, separation that we will be using not only at our schools but at our district office where visitors may come in to those areas as well as well as masks and gloves. So can we ensure that 
every teacher who's going to be on ground teaching receive a face shield? Is that too much to ask for? For all of our teachers and students right now, what we've been looking at is a cloth face mask that we will be able to provide all students and all teachers with two cloth face masks coming into the uh, into the year. Uh, we do have uh, areas of uh, individuals that will be provided the face shields uh, for uh, individuals who will have, such as bus drivers, where uh, we will not have a lot of social distancing on the bus. So the bus drivers will have face shields. Our uh, cashier uh, will have a face, our cashier uh, cafeteria manager, I'm, because I'm all of the students will go through that uh, particular area. I'm sorry, Mr. Brown. So you're like telling me that cashiers, but when I, the question of teachers, you say you're going to provide teachers and students with a cloth mask. So I guess it is too much to ask for that every teacher who is identified to, who's going to teach on ground for us to provide them with a face shield. That's too much to ask for? I'm not saying that's too much to ask for. What I'm saying is what we have what we have identified as uh, the plan at this current point. So, so I can't get a yes or a no. So we're not as a district and people are, people are as at home district. watching this. I understand it, people are, Mr. Brown. I understand it. People are at home watching this. People are at home watching this and I'm getting these questions as we're talking. People are saying, like, they keep saying we're gonna look into stuff. Why is this stuff not already done? And see, and here's the problem that I have, Mr. right? Brown, can I interrupt for just a minute? No, you cannot, Mr. Doss. I'm, I'm, I'm having a conversation with Dr. Kennedy and I'm just letting her know where I'm coming at from this because like I said, somebody just sent a question in. So. I just want us to be able to look into making sure that those I, teachers. I, I'm stop, are I am going to stop you for just a minute. I am going to stop you for just a minute. We, the teachers we that cannot, are on the ground, are they Ms. able Mr. to get Brown, a face mask? That's the second question. I'm going to have to gavel you down if you don't listen to me for just a moment. You sir, do what you got to do. I'm asking questions on behalf of the people. I understand what you're doing, and I'm very appreciative of you doing that. But we cannot continue. There was an so opportunity for. Mr. Brown. Don't try to gavel me because you're upset with the way that I'm asking the question. No, I'm gaveling you because I'm needing to talk to you and you to hear me. And I'm needing you to understand what's where we're at with this for today. And so your questions are very valid that you're being presented and they need to be answered. I agree with that wholeheartedly. But we have got to be able to get to a point of making a few decisions. We obviously are not going to make all the decisions and we haven't even heard from our other board members yet. If you continue to field questions and, and ask questions, people had the opportunity for public comment. They could have done that. But we cannot continue to take questions as they come in that way because we would be here all day long. There, well, we have no, people we that have got to go back to work. Like so we are going to be able to get. To and, like I, and that's why I asked, that's why I always asked in the beginning. And if we were smart, we would say, you know, we're going to allot board members a certain amount of time to be able to ask questions. That's why I always ask that coming into this, because I know that I have a lot of questions that need to be answered. And you've yet to take the leadership and say, Mr. Brown, we're going to give you 10 minutes. All right, each board member is going to have X, Y, and Z time. And so that's why I wanted to make it clear. I wanted to make it clear that I did have questions. And before I'm able to move forward and vote yes or no, I want to make sure that I have check boxes by the questions that have been asked of me. And I okay, know that know? we have three other board members that have questions, and I'm aware of that. But this okay. is what happens when we're in position. This is why in legislative assemblies, they limit time to debates and they let people ask these questions without it being looked upon as a person is doing too much and asking too much. And I understand that there are other people who have questions that are part of this body. And as soon as I'm done, I'll be able to yield the balance of my time so that they can uh, uh, finish what, what questions that they want to ask, sir. And how long, how many more questions do you have to ask? I have a total of four questions. I just stated that. Okay. If you will proceed with those. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Robert Rules of Order at work. All right. All righty. So families with multiple children might have various school attendance days. Will parents have input slash choice of which days work for their family? Uh, which are uh, you saying under option two or three? Mm -hmm. uh, are, you stick, are we talking about option one? Option one, under, everyone. Since needs option one. No, go ahead. I say option one, everyone will be attending the same days. If you're talking about option two or three, what we would be looking at is grouping families together if we were looking at options two or three for the okay. same attendance days. All right. All right. Three more questions that I have. Um, I, I still don't think that that the PPE question was answered um, with fidelity and, and, and effectively. Uh, will the district be willing to provide teachers who are on campus to provide them all with the necessary equipment, gloves, a mask, and a face shield? Will the district provide them with those three things? Gloves, a mask, and a face shield. What I can say right now, Mr. Brown, is that the plan right now that we have uh, has for masks and gloves. We do not have a plan at this time to provide face shields to all district staff. And so that is, that's something that we certainly can go back and look at, but as the plan stands, we have masks and gloves being provided to uh, students and, uh, excuse me, staff. All right, so I think that's something that we definitely need to go back and look at is that if we're going to have teachers on ground interacting with students, scholars, they need to have a face shield. All right. Can you move on? And to your next two more questions. I'm sorry. I just wanted you to go on to your next question being rushed wow all right um again we went back and we, we stated that the survey closed on june 22nd it's july 8th and so those numbers that were presented and even in the category of where you said that you know spalding county lies in right now i think with those numbers changing and you know 15 cases a day uh you know I think that we definitely need to go back and look at even this option. I really do think we need to go back and look at this option. And um, last but not least, um, for students who are choosing to, or parents who are, who are choosing to keep their scholars at home, have we determined how that meal distribution um, is going to be handled? There are uh, no procedures for right now for meal delivery or parent meal pickup under the National School Lunch Program. Uh, that waiver was granted under the seamless summer option for COVID-19. The waiver ended for us on June 30th. Uh, there are waivers identified by the Georgia Paths for Recovery for K-12 schools under the substantial spread category. Right now, Spalding County yes. is under the minimum to moderate spread. It, we certainly can change, as you indicated, uh, regarding the cases. But right now, we're under the minimum and moderate spread. The Georgia Pass for Recovery for K-12 schools uh, has a waiver under the substantial spread uh, category, which will allow for students to be fed through meal delivery or parent pickup. However, our county's current transmission uh, category level is minimum to moderate, which does not have that particular mm -hmm. waiver. Uh, Mr. Wheeler, our nutrition director, has a conference call scheduled on uh, with the Georgia Department of Ed on Thursday. And the, the, as we receive more information regarding that, we certainly will be able to share it. All right. Thank you so much. All right, Mr. Chair, that concludes um, the questions that I have. I greatly appreciate you not even allowing me because that didn't happen. I greatly appreciate the opportunity 
to speak up for the people that are in my district, regardless scholar, teachers, parentals. And I'm glad that I was able to get these questions answered for you. And um, hopefully someone at the district staff, Mr. Superintendent, is mm -hmm. monitoring the questions and the conversations that are going on in the thread right now so that we can get these questions answered. And I hope that in our quest to open up and do everything that we need to do, that our custodial issues that were addressed way before will be addressed as well um, for our maintenance and custodial uh, people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Also, Go ahead. Mr. Chair, I'd also ask that the questions Mr. Brown had that were not part of that, if he could submit those to us. Uh, we went through those questions very quickly and we, do, we, we want to make sure we don't miss anything. Uh, a lot of this, as we said, pointed out uh, that are in the presentation that we went over very quickly as well. And we'd like to make sure that we can uh, issue some type of a frequently asked questions uh, document that would answer these uh, adequately. All right, thank you. And Mr. Brown, you can do that. Let's move on to uh, Ms. Barbara Joe or Ms. Sue. Would either one of you like have questions? Go ahead, Ms. Cook. Mr. Chair, I don't have any questions at this point. Uh, I know that there are a lot of questions unanswered. I want to thank Dr. Kennedy and her committee. They have done an admirable job. This is a huge undertaking, and I do appreciate, as all board members do, what you have done. Uh, and I understand, Mr. Chair, we're here to decide on one of the options for reopening and that many of these questions can be answered later. Okay, Ms. Sue. Uh, thank you. I just uh, wanted to begin by saying um, thank you, Dr. Kennedy and your team and all the people at the board for uh, continuing to go down untreaded waters, uh, trying to come up with all the answers, which is very difficult to do. I also want to publicly thank uh, the employees and parents that have contacted me, um, not necessarily living in my district, but I am pleased that they felt comfortable enough to contact me and we had a lot of nice um, chats on the phone. Uh, one thing that I wanted to be sure the public is able to see once we make some some decisions is that they can see that 2021 plan, the link that we all can um, hit and go to the page that was so, um, but I don't think that's available to the public. Dr. K, is that true at this point? That's correct. It was uh, first wanted to be shared with the board and then sure. it will be uh, opened up. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. And I, I know that's a very fluid document and that could change also. Yeah. Okay, I just yes. wanted to make sure that it would be made available. I knew it would be, but I just wanted to make sure. I, I too feel like that we need to look at the comments made by, I don't see the comments on the YouTube um, thread. Um, I do hope that we are taking notes and answering uh, constituent questions. I think that's a very important and vital part of our work. I, I'm told that Lonnie is able, will be able to um, document that uh, as this moves along. Okay, because I know sometimes when I'm on a chat with an issue with AT&T or whatever, I can save the chat and email it to myself, that type mm -hmm. thing. So I would hope that would be available to us also. I, I do have something I want to bring up. Um, and Mr. Brown, I, I have to correct you on one of your uh, one of your um, comments that you made. Not only is Georgia, uh, we're, we uh, turned over 100,000 cases just yesterday, not 97,000. So we're in the top 10. We're, I think we're ninth in the country as far as the number of cases. Um, I think you mentioned 97,000 cases. As of 4 p.m. yesterday, we were over 100,000 cases and almost 3,000 deaths. And Spalding County is on the rise. I've talked with several people. Um, as Mr. Brown indicated, that Spalding County is, uh, I think we'll go from that moderate to, um, what's the next one level, Mr. Dr. K? Substantial spread. I, I just don't have a good feeling about this. Um, now I've talked to uh, several people. Um, I'm going to suggest, and I've talked to employees and parents that have suggested this to me. Um, I'm going to suggest today that we wait until after Labor Day to open school. 
only because of what we see every day in our in our own not only in our own city but in our state i don't know how we can be prepared to answer all the number one to answer all the questions and for everyone to feel comfortable about going back to work in fact i spoke to one of uh i've spoken to several leaders in our buildings and they don't want the responsibility of someone you know getting sick in their own school and you know I don't live in fear. I don't. But I think that we, if we, we, it's our job to protect our, not only our employees, our parents, our kids, our bus drivers, our nutritional people, our custodians. Uh, and I, I spoke with Mr. Smith this week about, I, I don't think we have enough custodians in the buildings. I have been told that we don't. When you go to Publix and you see two or three uh, kids that are just doing nothing but wiping down. Um, we've really got to think through this. Um, it's not like doing a gallbladder surgery where the procedure is same every day, basically. It's it's more detailed than that, and it's very fluid on a daily basis, as we all know. I'm not in favor of re requiring masks, and I'm going to tell you why. Because when I was still working as an educator, the uh, the number of students that I taught that had asthma was great was very, very high. That is a risk factor with regard to COVID. Just as diabetes is a risk factor with COVID. I'm not in favor of children wearing masks. I'm not in favor of teachers wearing masks. I can't even, when I go out to do the little bit of shopping I've done in the last four months and wear my mask, I am just, I'm so tired once I get home. I, it's just, uh, I don't know what it is. It's just a, a, a new paradigm shift for all of us, but I'm not in favor of, of wearing masks at all. I saw something on TV on the news last night where Delta is using new new state-of-the-art filters in their airplanes that are, I'm sure, more expensive. Have we considered uh, special HVAC filters for this particular pandemic in, in all of our buildings, not just the regular filters that we use now? Because that would be another way that we could perhaps um, be a little bit more proactive, so to speak. Um, but I think the questions that Mr. Brown asked were very valid. I know that there are people out there that are worried about going back to work and I put myself in that seat myself based on what's going on in our own community today. It is not a positive trend. It is a very negative trend with regards to the number of people that we are here to serve. And my recommendation today is that we wait until after uh, Labor Day to go back, which number one, gives our teachers, our parents and our students more time to get prepared. Hopefully the trend will will then have subsided somewhat. But I, I know I, the, the work that Dr. K and her team have done is, is incredibly uh, detailed and I appreciate all that, but I, I'm not in favor of us going back to school a week later, I'm just not. Based on what my constituents um, told me and conversations I have had with employees and parents. Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, sir. All right. So um, I understand that much discussion has been had in regards to option one. So at this moment, when we take the vote, um, are we able to uh, maybe put an amendment to the motion? to reflect Ms. McDonald's um, suggestion of starting after Labor Day? Sure, I mean, we can do however we want to do that. We don't have to accept the recommendation as presented. We can we can definitely change that. Uh, yeah, if I, there's no motion on the floor. Yeah, there's right. no motion on the floor. It's just, there's just a recommendation that has been that, that right. has been presented, so we haven't we have the opportunity to do that. Yes, Mr. W Mr. Dodd. Right, so that was, that was yes. my parliamentary yeah. inquiry, and so my my next inquiry becomes. Uh -oh. Let's um, let Miss McDonald guess... finish. Mr. Brown, let's let Miss McDonald finish. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Just a little bit more information. I know that Bibb County announced uh, last late yesterday afternoon that they're going to start after Labor Day. I sent that information to the superintendent late last night. Um, they're going to have the, um, there's going to be two choices, either, uh, actually it's option A, I think, um, option A for that, what we're, option one that we um, are talking about today, 
uh, two weeks in advance, parents would have to let the system know whether they're going to go in person or virtual. Um, I know Dublin, I believe Dublin City Schools is doing this also. I just don't think a week, a week later is going to, with the trends that we have going on right now, is going to suffice for our community. I just don't. Thank you. All right, Mr. Brown, if you're okay with me going ahead and making my comments before we circle back around to you, is that okay? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, I would just like to say that I, I am appreciative of all the hard work that has gone in, and I am in agreement with uh, not making a decision today on what day we start school back. Um, I think that we don't have enough information as board members to be able to make that call. I think we do have enough information to make the call on an option so that our staff can begin going to work to get answer get the answers to those questions that Mr. Brown you have presented and Ms. Sue that you have brought up so that uh, our people can be much more well informed. Um, I am also in agreement that it is very, very fluid with numbers seemingly on the rise. Uh, two weeks from now, it could change all the more um, or it could be that much better. We don't really know those answers. Uh, we are already set up at this moment to have a meeting every two weeks that is already scheduled uh, for the next six to eight weeks. Uh, so we are we are in a position that we can begin uh, making some of those decisions. My understanding, if and Mr. Smith, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you're prepared if we what the parents have said they wanted, teachers have said they wanted. Um, if we choose that, there's going to be another survey that goes out to begin finding out, because obviously if we have 29 to 35% of students choose to do virtual learning, uh, that is so much easier and doable than if we only have 5% of students <laughs> choose to do virtual learning. And uh, I think we have to have some of those more concrete numbers before we can move forward with anything else. So. But I think today I agree with Mr. Brown. I think those figures, although you can, as, as I mentioned, it's, all of this is very fluid, but I think those figures today that Dr. K presented would be somewhat different. Um, well, if you're if you're watching what's going on in the state and the community, uh, I know they would be. And that's not a, a detriment to the, the work she and her task force have done. It's just it's just the reality of, of, the, of what's going on in our own community today. So absolutely. Yeah. Ms. McDonald, can I respond to that? Because I, you're right, this has been a very fluid situation. And uh, right now, the, the plan that we've got is under the guidance and the designations that we currently have. But the plan itself recognizes that as situations change, decisions have to be made as well. And so that's, that's, not, that's not something we have not considered. What Mr. Doss is talking about is a, is a second survey that would go out if option one is, is adopted today as our primary direction, that then would allow parents, all parents, we would have to get this from all parents, not just the 53% that, that, that um, respond to the original survey, but they would need to tell us in a, in a positive way whether they wish their child to return to the in-building program or to the remote learning program. So that we can gather those exact numbers and see just what we've got to do to make those programs work. All that we really know right now is that the, that the majority, a large majority of our staff and parents who took the survey, which was when you look at the participation rate we had was really pretty good for a survey like this. Sure. Seem to like the option one of allowing in school or remote learning option rather than the, uh, the splitting up of a week or the splitting up of weeks by uh, student groups coming in and out of the building. They preferred that one. But there are a lot. There's a, there's there's a lot left to be done, and you're correct. It's it's very concerning watching the numbers increase, and there may be more guidance that comes out of the federal government, the state government, uh, as well. But I think if you will look at what we've put in this plan, we've also put put in those safeguards that do anticipate it being a um, that, that, that there that there are going to be more cases out there, more risk out there. That's why the the, the line is in the plan about the wearing of the mask. There are many places that have said they weren't going to require a mask. They had no anticipation of people wearing masks. I see it today. The mayor of Atlanta says that she's going to sign an order requiring masks 
in the right. same way. But we put that in here because we know there's a risk out there. It would have been very easy to come back with some type of a, a different recommendation on that. But, but given the circumstances, we can start out with a more stringent requirement to wear the mask. It can always be backed off if circumstances allow. But we're going to start there because we know what's sitting out there right now. Um, I'm hoping and praying it doesn't get much worse, but the chances are it may. And um, so I think what we've put in here are those more stringent uh, pieces that, that can be backed off later. They would have been much harder to put in place as it gets worse, if it gets worse. But if the designation changes for our county, the whole model may need to, may, may need to change accordingly. Right. I, I still think that we need to back up school um, to after Labor Day. And I, I like option A. I think most of you know that uh, to give parents the choice. But I think we need to set a date first and then work on options later. And we, and we talked about that, but I would also point these things out to think about too. Number one, if we eliminate the month of August from the school instruction calendar, we've already talked about five days being taken. Out. This would be another 15 or 16 days or so. That would drop our student uh, calendar down to about 155 days, I believe. Maybe a little lower than that, actually. Um, so would you also be looking at other changes to the calendar later in the year to recoup students? I know we have waivers on seat time, right. but then comes that practical matter of can you cover the material that's being expected in that reduced number of days? So would you be looking at adding days back somewhere either at the end of the school year to extend the year or look at the breaks during the year as a place to put student days or simply just waive the days uh, if we cut the month of August out? I would, be, I would be in favor of waiving the days because I think we need to spend more time on social and emotional at this point when kids come back. You know what I'm saying? I understand that. And, and we do have the social emotional piece in this plan as well as far as right. addressing those needs that we know are going to be there. In fact, I'm going to bring one back from a budgetary standpoint as well that recognizes the very likely increase in the need for social emotional support in our schools for staff, families, and students. So I, I do understand that. The second thing, though, is we do need to, to look and see what a later start would do in terms of uh, students who are currently enrolled in dual enrollment classes and how that might impact those schedules because Southern Crescent, I believe, is that. Ms. Cook, I believe they set their date for opening classes. I think it was a little later than August 12. I don't remember if it was the 17th, I believe. But we would need to be sure that we understood the implications for students doing dual enrollment at Gordon or at Southern Crescent or other places as to what their requirements would be to begin their classes. I would, I would take it they would probably need to go on the college schedule if they're taking a college course for credit. So we want to be sure that we don't have a problem with that as well. Sure, I agree with that. I just, uh, I, I don't, I just don't feel good. I told you last night, I don't feel good at the trends that are showing, and I feel like it's going to get a lot worse before it gets a lot better. All right, board members, are there any other questions that need to be asked before we can make a decision on the option? Obviously, we're not going to be making a decision on. A start date because we need more information that the staff is going to go and put together for us. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming, Mr. Smith, you within that survey that goes out, is it possible to uh, ask the parents their thoughts about if we feel the need to add school days back, when that would happen, um, or you know, those are just some some um, ways of getting some feedback from our parents and scholars as to what is important to them. I understand and I think it depends on whether we feel like we need to, how far we need to back the year up. Um, Ms. McDonald's point about spending more time on social and emotional, or do you need to add the days back in? I think that's gotta be part of the discussion that we have leading up to that. Okay, Mr. Brown, you had your hand. A different point. Yeah, so I also think that at this point, thank you for recognizing Mr. Chair. Um, I think at this point, um, 
whatever we decide to do, I think immediately we need to go and go back and make sure that we add parents and scholars to this reopening task force. Um, because I think a lot of input from parents was left out because they did not have a seat at the table. So I understand where we are at this point in process. We need to make sure that parents have a seat at the table and that scholars have a seat at the table. And, um, I, and I know people are looking for a date today, so I'm going to go ahead and, and, and just, you know, be quiet so we can go ahead and take the vote and move forward with what needs to happen. Okay, so at this point in time, I would entertain a, a motion for one of the options that has been presented or option one that was presented to us um, as the <clears throat> basis for which to begin the staff to be able to begin their work on bringing us the additional information that has been requested. Mr. Doss, could, could, I, could I say something? Sure. Before we do that, I, I, think, I think everyone listening I think we need a date before we need an option. Because everyone out there wants to know, okay, when is Griffin Spalding actually going to start? So I would hope that we would do the date first and then today I'm, I'm going to vote for option one because that's what our people want. And that's, it's, it's pretty, pretty evident that that's what they want. But I think parents and teachers and employees want a date so to speak, so they can, so they can plan. Is it okay to give a date and put, put a date down and then be able to move it? Uh, it assuming if we're not, don't feel as though we're ready to be able to take that date and how much time needs to be in between that. So in other words, <clears throat> could we go all the way to, to after Labor Day? We could, but you know, we get two weeks out from La Labor Day, we may need to extend it a little farther. Uh, well, and that's very true, but that's just that's just the, that's just what we're dealing with as a, as a as a body and as a governance team and as a society. I mean, it's it's all going to be very fluid. But I think for today, people are looking for us to come up with a date, not necessarily a, a, the plan, so to speak. Is well, I, Ms. McDonald, I would, and I, I, Ms. McDonald, I would say this in that regard. I think people do want a date. But the plan itself was built around and included the one week delay in opening. And so if, if, we're going, if we're going to look at something more than that, then we need to go back and be able to pull out those implications of a later start date and be sure that see how those impact this particular option. So I really, I really believe that getting the option in place is what gives us the ability then to move forward with building the plan inside that option. Wait, I, I wait so how do we, how do we put that plan inside the option? I'm a little confused on that one. So well, we if, have, with what McDonald suggested after Labor Day, which I think is a great suggestion, and then you're saying, let's go ahead and, you know, whatever the option is and, how do we put that plan into the option or suggestion into the option? Well, the, the, the original suggested opening date of August 12 was part of that plan that was developed inside the option that was shown as being the favorite option by parents and staff. So that's, that's how we built it. If we're going to go back and look at, at other types of opening dates, then the plan may need to be uh, modified in some way to accommodate a different opening date. But the, but the overall option itself of being a return to the in-school format or the option to do remote learning as being the two uh, still would be the primary framework that we are, uh, we're working with. So can we make an amendment to the option, the date? So, Let's say instead of August 12th, it be September 14th. It, it is possible to do that, but I think that it would, it would be premature today to do that 
without looking at the implications of making that drastic a change in the date and then thinking through what it may do to the remainder of the school year. But, I, but Mr. Smith, I think that's what waivers are for. It gives, it gives systems the option to do what is best for their particular systems at that point in time. And, and yes. we're, you know, we're dealing with a moving target here. We're, we're dealing with a chicken that's going across the road at different speeds. And, and my teacher mind says wave. I mean, I think most teachers would be up for it, but I think as a board, we need to determine whether or not I mean, with this option, we can make an amendment to the date. Mr. Brown, why would you say the September 14th? Why not the 8th? I was just curious. Is, um, is I was just thinking Monday after Labor Day. Oh, yeah, because see, I was just thinking the day after. So. And, and I understand that, but I, 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 I and, and the board can 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 take the action that um, it wants to take. But I really so, believe that if, we, if we're going to look at a date that goes that far down the line, we need to do it not just we need to do it in a in a in a directed uh, thought out manner as to what the implications are of moving a start date that far down the line. That was not part of the original discussion original plan. The, so that, that just sends the that, that option. Well, that just but sends the, everybody back to the drawing board. I think if other school districts were able to to do it, that's something that we can look into as well. So, you know, I was thinking the 14th, if it's the 8th, which is a Tuesday, Miss McDonald, I definitely can compromise and support that. And so I think today we need to go ahead and, and set forth whether we're going to do option one, um, you know, and I'd like to make an amendment that says option one with a start date of September 8th or the 14th, whatever we can agree on, versus option one with a start date with August 12th. And so those are the two options that um, I think should be out on the table. Well, I agree with that. So yeah, that. I mean, the plan, the plan can always be changed. It's just that I'm just basing my recommendation on, on what I see every day is going on in our own community. Yeah. I mean, I told you last night, Mr. Smith, I had a, a friend of mine call me and I told Ms. Cook this, that, you know, they're in the daughter's office. There's 14 or 15 people in the daughter's office and half of them turned out to be positive. And that's right here in Griffin. So it's, it's just not good right now. And, and I just, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, can we go ahead and, and, Take care of whatever motion is set forth to see if it passes or fail, and then make them want it and then just go from there. Can we go ahead and do that? I wanted to finish giving my opinion about the the start date uh, because I'm oh, I'm, all, I'm all in favor of moving forward with a, getting an option. I am just not in favor of setting a that far a, a whole month away as the official date until we've given the staff an opportunity to see how that affects us. Um, I am, I would be fine with, you know, moving it, pushing it, not from the 12th, maybe to the 19th or the 26th of August um, to be able. And then at that, our 21st meeting that we have, we have a meeting on July 21st. We're going to have that survey data back. We're going to have a lot of the information back. And we may decide at that point in time, Labor Day is, you know, right after Labor Day is when we need to do that. Or they may say we're good to go at this point in time. All right, let we me ask, can I ask Dr. Kennedy a question? Sure. Okay, so can we can we get out an email today to all of our staff or can we send, do we have the option of sending a text message to all of our teachers, parents, whatever, yes or no? A, start date this, B, start date this, and get that get that immediately. How quickly can we get the turnaround on the data that we need at this point in time? So, using, te using technology. I, I, I mean, well, Mr. Smith, do you want to? I don't want to. I'd like to weigh in on the question, but go ahead and answer. I mean, as far as putting together a, a simple survey and the push out, does that, your question is to time, how quickly can that happen? Yes. Um, I mean, that can happen fairly quickly, even if it's not today, it could be first thing tomorrow. Um, if we're talk talking about the start, if you're talking about this uh, question about start date, if y'all are wanting the opinion 
in reference to a feedback in reference to a start date, uh, Mr. Smith. That that's true. We could we could do that, but I'm afraid we don't really have information out there other than what you know, to, to explain the implications of a a move later. And, and I I would just throw this out, and and then the I'll let the board uh, act as it deems is appropriate to represent um, you know the, the interest. But it's a lot easier to start with a date, a target date of August the 12th, and eventually move it to September the 8th is to start with a date of September the 8th and try to move it back into August. And that's where I would like to have the time for us to look at the implication of what a later date means. Do we really want to use the waiver and just and not make up those dates? Is that going to be part of the deal? And if it is, then that's what that's what parents and students would need to know going in, that if you choose the later date, it simply means less instructional days. It would, it would or would not mean the days would be made up somewhere else. But I would hate to come back later and say, you chose a later start date, but now you want to make up the days. So I think it's easier to move the date later to start than it is to back it up earlier. And that's well, what I'm, as a parent, I'm not sure about that because parents have to make, you know, they have to make, they have to make a lot of decisions for their own families. And I, 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 would, I would disagree with that somewhat. So think, can we yeah, make the motion to? I think. So can we go ahead and take a vote? That, all right. Mr. Chair, are you are you done with your comments? I am. All right. So, can we? The motion on the table for option one. Okay. Are we able to amend that and take out the August twelfth start date? And put in the September 14th start date. No, not 14th. Not the 14th. Or September 8th. Yeah. I mean, Ms. Cook, what do you think? Ms. Cook. I can I'm coming in and out. Okay. I just wanted to know what you felt. And plus we're not doing milestones anyway, so what days we need, yeah. we need to make up? All right. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. All right. Your question about start date. The start date. Uh, if we can get a start date at the next meeting, I would be in favor of going ahead and deciding on action. I mean, option one now, but I think that our parents need to know ASAP when the start date is going to be. So I wouldn't want this to linger a long time. If we could do a start date as a board in two weeks, I'd be in favor of just approving the option and then coming back later and approving the start date. And, you know, another thing, I, another thing that has just come to my attention is that, and Dr. Kay, I mentioned this, I asked before, is that the document that we have seen as a board our teachers have not seen this. Is that correct? The 2021 plan? Is that correct? That is correct. You see, I don't think that's very fair to our employees. They they need to see that document and we need to get input from them. You know, I'm going to tell you, if I had to go back on August, whatever it is, I, I'm, I'm very worried. I really am because the trend is not good at this time, but I don't think it's fair for me to make a decision for 1,800 employees that have not seen the document that only the Board of Ed has seen today. I just don't think that's very fair because I feel like, and, I, and I, although I know the copious amount of work and dedication went into it and it's a start, it's very fluid, but you know, knowledge is power and we can gain so much knowledge from our employees based on that particular document where we can add to or delete or add to. I, I just don't think it's very fair that they haven't seen it. And I appreciate the fact that you wanted your, you and your group showed it to the board. I, I, I get that. I understand that. But I feel like that we need to put this out to the 1,800 people that we're asking to come back to work. But the plan is also parents and kids. But the plan and because of that, I believe it's best that we go ahead and just change the date from the 12th to the 8th. 
And whatever go needs ahead. to happen within the workings in that process, go ahead and let it happen. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Smith. We're not missing many days due to it. I mean, not being a milestone test. Let's go ahead and just change the date, September 8th, and let's go with option one. Let's let's hear Mr. Smith was trying to share also. I, I, I wanted to I wanted to assure Ms. McDonald though that the plan was always to expose the document. Oh, but, I know that. But if we, if we if we put it out before the board sees it, it looks like it's already an official document. Okay. And we I don't get want it. to go out looking like so I, I don't want to get the impression we're trying to hide it because we're not. We're trying to send it out when it has official backing from the board to be put gotcha. as such. If the board yeah. wishes to change the date, that's the board's. That's the board's. That sounds good, Mr. Superintendent, but that's not what happened. And I'm and I'm not and I'm and I'm not implying I'm not implying that, Mr. Smith, at all. So if it, if it sounded like I was implying that, that certainly wasn't my intent. I just want to be sure that we get as much feedback as we can from the people that are going to be in the brick and mortar, so to speak. So no, I wasn't trying to imply that at all. So if, okay. if that's the way it came across, I apologize. So I don't think that there was an official motion that was made, if I'm not mistaken, or did Mr. Brown, did you actually make a motion? Yeah, so I would like to make a motion to go with option one and changing the start date from August 12th to September 8th. Can I have a motion? Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Ms. Barbara Jo Cook seconded. Uh, any further discussion on that? Okay, hearing none, all in favor signify by raising your right hand. Miss Barbara Joe, I can't see, no, I can see it now. Okay, that'll be four zero. Uh, I'm just making sure that Mr. Holmes did not ever get on the call, is that correct? I did not see him come in. Okay, so then we can begin with that survey and then our meeting on the 21st, we can get an update of where we're at with this process. Can I ask Mr. Akins a question, please? Go ahead, Ms. Uh, Sue. Mr. Akins, I know that you sent me a text message and I appreciate that. Can you let, I know we have uh, several hundred people watching. Can you just explain the, the kind of filters that we have in our schools with regard to HVAC, please? Uh, I can do uh, that, Miss Miss McDonald. Uh, what we have are uh, ionization uh, units within our HVAC. With all the renovations that we've done, uh, those are required now. Uh, we're going back uh, and looking at all of them, but we have ionization uh, units within our HVAC, which actually contributes to killing germs uh, and also allergens that come back through. So. Uh, when you were talking about new filters and things like that, that's that's something that we've been working on with renovations uh, as we've gone through for several years now. Okay, and in older buildings that haven't been renovated, what are our options? Uh, we're working on those. There are possibility of filters. Uh, I think in the past we've used some HEPA filters and things of that nature in, but I'd have to find out uh, exactly how many um, my understanding is that most of our units now throughout the whole system uh, have the uh, ionization units. Good. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just wanted our, our people listening to alleviate some concerns along those lines. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, board members. Um, we've all had an opportunity to talk. I don't know if there is any additional comments that need to be made. We have, do have something for executive session that will be fairly fairly quick. I know that uh, several have to get back to uh, their day jobs. Um, is there any board member that feels the need to make a comment? Yeah, I just want to say that. thank you to everybody. No, I, I'll defer to Sue. Go ahead, Ms. McDonald. Okay, thank you, Mr. Brown. Listen, I, I just want to be sure that Dr. K and, and Mr. Smith understand that I wasn't implying anything negative about the document that we have seen today that that was certainly not my intent i just want to be sure that we utilize the the 1800 uh life experiences that we have before us to make the document even better so i just want to be uh, doubly sure that you all understand that i wasn't trying to imply that we were 
trying to hide anything. I don't feel that. I don't believe that. But uh, I just think knowledge is power and, and more power that are involved. We all get smarter. Thank you. Mr. Brown. Yes, I do want to say to Dr. Kenny and her team, thank you so much uh, for all, all your hard work that was put into this. Um, I do want us to make sure, and no one seems to be able to answer that question. Can we put a parent, two parents and a scholar on this reopening task force? I know that there's much more work to do, but we need to be able to add our constituency to the task force. Everyone needs to sit at the table. And you guys mentioned that it was an oversight in the beginning. Can we please correct the oversight today? I believe that can be the session. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ms. No, 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 no. I need an answer. No, 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 no. I need an answer. He he answered, you missed it. He said he believes that can be done. Yeah, he can said yes. be done. Shall can and will are two different things. He he just answered yeah. yes. Yes, thank you so much. All right. And lastly is thank you to all the colleagues who came together today to listen to one another. Uh, seems like we were governed a lot better when we are able to listen to each other and um, leave our implicit biases at the door. Um, and I will be sure to forward you guys the questions that I had today. So as you come up with your frequently asked questions, um, we're able to um, answer those and, you know, everybody's operation and uh, operating in transparency. So definitely want to say thank you to all that and to the supporters uh, from District 1 and all across the county. Uh, thank you for your support. Um, and you know, as we talk about the letter of reprimand that the chair does not have the authority to do, um, you know, I greatly appreciate uh, you guys electing me and letting me be your voice. Thank you so much. All right, Ms. Barbara Jill. I just want to thank Dr. Kennedy and her staff again, and the entire central office staff, our superintendent, for the copious quantities of hours that have gone into this. Please know how much we do appreciate it. I want to thank the board for your thorough discussion. We're all in this together, and we are going to get through this, and our students are going to be the winners. So thank you very much. All right. Well, we... Uh... Thank you for the general public um, being with us today. Uh, we are going to, our, at this time, I would entertain a motion to go into executive session. So which means that we have a motion. I'm sorry? Employment of personnel. For the employment of personnel. Thank you, Mr. Smith. So I had a motion and a second. All in favor signify by raising your hand. Okay, got everybody there. Uh, Thank you to everybody that it will not be an executive session. You may be dismissed. Okay. Mr. Doss. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to.